Anyone that's been at Ohio State long enough to have read one of the many plaques around campus has probably seen the words Land Grant University. That Land Grant University. Land Grant Land Grant universities. Land Grant universities. Land Grant University. And yet, like me, had absolutely no idea what that actually meant. Can you explain to me what a land grant university is? <laughs> um, uh, I've heard of the. Yeah, I see this word everywhere. Oh God, I have no idea what that is. I have no idea. No. I could not. I have no idea what is that. This question, what is a land grant university, led me down countless hours of reading online articles and researching this topic. And now I think probably the best place to start to explain to you what a land grant university is, is the beginning with the Land Grant Act of 1862. For many years in the late 19th century, we had many politicians advocating for a federally funded higher education system. One of these politicians was Vermont Senator Justin Morrill. Yes, Morrill, as in Lincoln and Morrill Tower. This land grant act is the reason that we have two fairly ugly towers on West Campus. But Morrill, like all of his predecessors, ran into a lot of resistance trying to get this act through Congress. Uh, it took Morrill 10 years or so to finally get it passed. This is David Staley. He is an associate professor of history and the instructor of the History of Ohio State class. Largely, it was resistance by Southern legislators uh, against the Land Grant Act. And that especially had to do with um, how the Land Grant Act was to be funded. And so a common refrain that we hear in 2022 was actually uh, echoed in that past. People saying federal government had no right, no, no reason to be involved in that. And this is Steve Gavazzi, professor in the College of Education and Human Ecology, author and head of the Stepping Out and Stepping Up Research Project. Uh, fortunately for uh, U.S. higher education, they lost their vote when they decided to leave the country. So a year after the Civil War started, President Lincoln signed the Morrill Land Grant Act into action, and with that, the Land Grant Universities were born. Yet, that name, Land Grant, is often a misunderstanding. The Land Grant Act means, and this is something that is, is, is sometimes confused, I think, the Land Grant Act did not provide land on which the universities would sit. Uh, we sometimes hear that in our classes, and that's, that, that's not what it was. The land grant was a grant of land that states would then sell, the proceeds of which would be used to support the creation of a university. So the states with their newly founded funds were tasked with creating universities, but not just any universities. They had a list of criteria that they first had to meet. First was who were they supposed to teach? They were supposed to teach the sons and daughters of toil. And they were supposed to teach them three main skills, agriculture, the mechanical arts, and military science. Agriculture is pretty self-explanatory. At this time, agriculture was the main dominating force of the American economy, and so naturally, improving the efficiency and the production of agriculture was just in the general interest of everybody. Mechanical arts may sound strange, but is really just what today what we call engineering. That's a pretty self-explanatory field as well. Military science, though, is often a little hard to understand why that was such a big focus. Something that we sometimes overlook when we're looking at the history of land grants is that in addition to agriculture and mechanical arts, they were also supposed to teach military science. Some of the reasons for that had to do with, well, the, the, the situation the country found itself at the time. So uh, the Morrill Land Grant Act was passed in the middle of the Civil War. Part of the feeling was, was that there wasn't enough officer or military training that the southern states had all the military academies and that there wasn't anything quite like that in northern states. As important as the what of what these universities were teaching it is also very important to understand who they were teaching. So until the Morrill Act went into place, the typical college student was wealthy, they were white, and they came primarily from urban areas. So what we were really looking at was opening up a broad vista uh, that would allow those who were female 
those who did not come from backgrounds of wealth all had all of a sudden the opportunity to go to school. The Morrill Land Grant Act was revolutionary for its time. It created a uniquely American education system with all universities united under one central goal, but also gave them the autonomy to pursue that mission however they thought best. And in subsequent years after 1862, we saw more land grant acts that expanded the university system to all states, including those southern states where the senators had once rallied against the idea of a federally funded education system. For most of the 160 years that land grant universities existed, no one really thought to ask, where did that land come from? I had always understood land grant universities as emerging out of the Morrill Act uh, in the 1860s, that the land was uh, used by the federal government to endow state universities. This is John Lau, Associate Professor in the Department of Comparative Studies and citizen of the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi Indian Tribe. Just had this concept of it as being a noble thing. But with the uh, expose from High Country News, they asked the question, whose land? Whose land was being used for the land grant universities? And come and uh, find out it's uh, land taken from American Indian people, the tribal nations. That's the land that was converted into cash by the federal government and then relayed to the states to create their state university system. And so that's a whole new ball game. This may all come as no surprise. After all, all US land was once native land, but the high country news not only looked at what land was used to fund land grant universities, they went and they tracked down every single acre and tied those acres back to their appropriate land grant universities. They found that land all the way from Michigan to as far west as California. Over 10.7 million acres divided between 52 universities was stolen from 245 native tribes, including the one John Lau is a citizen of. Ohio State, for instance, was funded by over 600,000 acres of land, which the US government only paid $35,000 for, which the state of Ohio ended up selling for 10 times that amount. This realization was a bombshell in the land grant university community. The publication of the High Country News Land Grab University Report came the exact same week that I had handed in the manuscript for the Fulfilling the 21st Century Land Grant Mission book. To say that I was shocked is a drastic understatement because literally everything that we had written in two complete volumes said nothing at all about the, the land grab nature of this. I never even questioned when I had been thinking land grant. Well, it was just, yes, land granted, right? Not ever thinking about where that land came from. I was on the verge of seemingly ignorant about facts that I, I really believe I should have known about. What do you feel is the most important lesson to glean from this article being published? The biggest takeaway, I think for all of us, is we don't know what we don't know. See, there's no shame in that. There's nothing to be ashamed of about not knowing. Uh, but once you know, then there's the imperative to act. And so now we all know. And so now the imperative kicks in. This imperative fueled Steve Gavazzi to create a research team that would go to those native tribes whose land funded the Ohio State University and ask them, what do they expect in return? For hundreds of years, we have told indigenous peoples what we were going to do to help them. And so one of the things that we all made a commitment to, listening and asking the question, what do you need from us? Because what we're doing uh, specifically with this grant, we are reaching out to tribal nations, the tribal nations whose land was taken and sold to contribute to the endowment. We're reaching out to them informing them of this situation. Many of them had no idea either. And then asking them, what does a remedy look like to you? And that's a very long conversation that takes a lot of time and is beyond the parameters of this specific grant. But we've gotten some ideas. And so for many tribal leaders, they look at us and they say, you're in the education business. You should be helping uh, our sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters to get an education. And 
we believe that we've already paid for that education through the land that was transferred to you. So the idea of scholarships, full ride, tuition, room board, those are the kinds of things that at the very least we should be doing for the descendants of these people. But we think that it goes beyond that because again, when all of this tremendous wealth was transferred from these tribes to the state governments and then by association to the universities, we broke a cycle of resources for them. And in so doing, we also broke our relationships with them. Land-grant universities have not seen Native nations as part of their family. We talk about the Buckeye Nation, right? Well, Buckeye Nation should include the Native nations whose land was taken and sold in order to found The Ohio State University. I believe that once we get to the place where we see these Native nations as part of Buckeye Nation, I think then everything changes. I think that we have developed a action plan that is very thoughtful and comprehensive in what we're doing. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that we are reaching out to tribal nations and asking them to participate in this whole process. And I think we have created a, a template for other universities to look at what are they doing at the OSU? So what damage has been done to the land grant mission as a result of the land grab university report? We could only hope that that land grab university report had any impact right now on the land grant mission. I wish that that were the case. Uh, it has not impacted the land grant mission. What we're finding is that people are only now, two years after that report, beginning to even understand that that report exists, let alone that something should be done about that. So we're very much engaged right now in an educational approach to our own universities, including our own university administrators. Yet Steve and his group are not discouraged by this lack of knowledge in higher parts of the administration. Almost a quarter million dollars uh, of internal funding has been given to us by The Ohio State University. So the question is not whether or not Ohio State as an institution is interested in this work. They are. The question is going to be what they do about the findings and the recommendations that we make as a result of this work. I did reach out to the university and ask them if they wanted to give a statement. The university's spokesperson, Ben Johnson, said, Ohio State is committed to diversity and inclusion and offers programs and courses as well as operating the Newark Earthworks Center. They also said, and I quote, Ohio State strives to create an inclusive campus community that is open, welcoming, and accessible to all. The university is committed to developing a land acknowledgement and engaging with indigenous communities around the country. In my interviews, I wanted to round out our discussions with talking about what are the challenges that land-grant universities are facing in the years to come. There are enormous financial pressures that the university will continue to face as it sees its state funding continue in its uncertain state. I think that there are a number of challenges that the university faces. The first one is the a, a growing sense in this country that universities somehow aren't valuable or that attending university doesn't really matter. Uh, and I really think that that's a problem because on the one hand, what we offer, sort of training preparation for a modern global economy, is something that lots of people need and it's something that we provide. Uh, and I think there's general agreement that, that that sort of training and education is needed and necessary. And so if it's not universities providing it, who will? The challenge is to continue to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that that's uh, very important. The idea to teach, research, and serve the American people in a way that is both affordable and accessible is no small task. And we have seen getting here it hasn't been easy, and it isn't without its trials and tribulation. But at the same time, we shouldn't let this imperfect history discourage us from being what Steve Gavazzi calls being land-grant fierce. This is the idea that we should be passionate about this grander mission we're all a part of, 
and be dedicated to ensuring that in the future, no one else gets disenfranchised on our road to creating an equitable higher education system.